All right, so as I was about to say, the only thing that I basically told John about other than that I asked if I could interview him was that we would be talking about professional development. Um, and that's when you're sort of approaching your initial sus uh, subjects, um, you know, the folks that you potentially want to interview, you want to give them sort of a broad topic as to what you're looking to talk to them about. Um, you know, if they do express some interest, then you want to sort of, you know, be able to get to that elevator pitch. And by the elevator pitch, I mean essentially your 20 to 30 seconds of, you know, this is what my study is about, or this is what I'm looking to, this is the kind of information I'm looking to get at. Right. So my initial pitch to get John to do this was that I wanted to, you know, talk to him a little bit about professional development. So I'm going to start the interview now, and that way you can get a sense as to, you know, how much information you want to provide. Um, so, thank you, John, for agreeing to be interviewed tonight. And um, as I mentioned, I want to talk to you a little bit about professional development, specifically your own perceptions of some of the professional development that you've received as a teacher. In the uh, in most recently, or well, or actually, I was going to say, think about a recent um, professional development experience that you've had, and tell me a little bit about it. Um, recently. Uh, let's see. The recent one. My most recent one. Uh, I was interested in in a uh, topic with with uh, dealing with mathematics, and it would there was a, a person that was coming to Massachusetts that was uh, he, he was well known. And his his theories and his ideas were were really widely accepted, and, and a lot of great positive reviews uh, came from from previous professional developments. Um, so I went to my principal and I asked I asked if I could actually go, and she is very very open for people to pursue their things that they're that are interested that they're interested in. So she allowed me to go. Um, it was it was a great experience, and I was able to go with a special ed uh, teacher. So we were able to talk and bounce ideas off of each other. How we're going to use the strategies and manipulatives that were were uh, brought up in the in the professional development. We uh, were able to bounce these ideas off each other when we came back. It, it's, it was a great experience. That's my most recent one. Okay. And when was that? That was uh, spring of, uh, yeah, it was May. Okay. So you had a little bit of time at the end of the year with your students after yes. you come back? Yes, absolutely. Were there any things that you, that came up at the, the session that you were able to use with your own students when you got back? Anything that you might have tried? I, I did. I did. I tried uh, several, several uh, activities with um, different ways to approach algebra with struggling students. So um, kind of bouncing those ideas of with, with the special ed teacher, um, we pulled in some uh, some of those strategies within the classroom. It was fantastic. Um, the, the kids really enjoyed it. They were excited. Um, yeah, and, and it's kind of pushing me to go to um, and learn more about Learn more about uh, the strategies that that person brought up. Yes. Can you provide me with one specific strategy that came out of the PD that you've tried with your class? Um, one I is is through uh, in, instead of actually providing uh, instead of having the, the students instead of having having them, the students, kind of think algebra is an abstract, right? So instead of assuming that an eighth grader or a seventh grader has multiplication, for example, um, under, their, under their belt, um, the, the, the strategies that we were using uh, with, with base 10 blocks, for example, um, or we were using uh, 
fraction strips, um, not fraction, uh, if or fraction bars. Uh, we were using those in different ways um, to show them visually how how the math worked. And some of the some of the students were like, "Ah, oh, this is going to be uh, I already know this stuff." But there were some some students, and the ones I was really kind of trying to get to were the, the students that were kind of struggling in the first place. So, uh, so the, these students, some of the, some of the students, I'm giving giving them uh, the manipulatives and the visuals in front of them, um, and having them kind of moving around. Uh, they were able to really kind of um, see how how it all kind of fit together. And then there were there were we we did it over the course of several several days. Um, but there were a couple of students that really kind of went, wow, right, that's, I, that, this makes sense to me. With that said, some of my other students who, who were kind of like, eh, it's okay. So it, it got me to think, well, you know, it, ju it just reinforces the fact that not all strategies work for every, every student also. So, I don't know. When you think about that particular example, mm -hmm. the way in which it was presented by the person delivering professional development mm -hmm. and the way in which you implemented it. Did right. you need to go about modifying it at all or were you able to sort of implement it the way in which he had talked about it or she had talked about I it? I kind of implemented it the way, the way the person had talked through it. Um, so they kind of, they started, basically the, the, the person kind of started with, this is what, what a child would learn in third grade and then this is how it progresses the fourth and fifth Six, seven, and eight, and this is if if they didn't get this this uh, part in fourth grade, and they move on to fifth, well then they're missing this this chunk. Um, so um, the person kind of recommended kind of seeing where they are and just kind of yeah, I, I'm dropping down and trying those these activities. Certainly not not by any by no means did the person say you know, do it word for word or step by step, but these are some strategies you can use and, and he gave, gave us a whole bunch of handouts and had some, had some videos and that kind of stuff for us to watch. Okay. I guess so. speaking about the types of things that he did at the professional development yeah. stuff, um, can you describe to me how these strategies were presented to oh, you? Oh, absolutely. That, that, was a, that was a really cool part. First of all, the, the guy was pretty energetic. I wish I could remember his name because I can't. I'm sorry, um, but uh, he was energetic. But he had it all in front of, um, in every, in every at every desk, um, in front of every teacher. Um, they had a set of manipulatives, um, set of it, all the materials that you needed, crayons and markers, and um, he had sticky pads for for people. He had the base ten blocks. He had. Um, it went on and on and on, but and uh, you know it, it was a lot of fun to play with. Um, at first, he let us play and kind of build anything we wanted, kind of kind of what I do in the classroom, you know, let, let them kind of feel around with it and stuff. Um, so people were really excited and they were excited to kind of play it around. It. Oh yeah, this is how it worked in the classroom. And you can kind of see. It. I don't know. That's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, essentially, as I indicated on the uh, protocol, at the top there in italics would be essentially the general purpose for my study and the specific two research questions that I was interested in answering. So you can see I was really just interested in exploring what teachers thought about professional development. And my specific questions were, what were their perceptions? And then, were they able to use it? That's a, essentially what it breaks down to. You know, was it useful for them is another way of, of saying that. Now, if you look at it, for my actual interview protocol, I had two broad general questions. You'll notice that I started off the interview with the first one. You know, think about a recent professional development experience. Now, I'll be perfectly honest with you and say that as I was putting this together, I had never even thought about the possibility 
that when I asked John that question, that he was going to tell me about a time where his principal paid for him to go somewhere else. When I set this whole thing up, in my mind, I was thinking about, you know, those sessions that you do at the end of the day or for the half day that the school is closed, those kind of things. That's one of those things that may happen to you. And I'm kind of glad it happened in this because while it wasn't planned, it is actually a good example of one of the reasons, A, that you'd want to pilot test an instrument. Because if I had pilot tested that with two or three teachers, chances are one of them might have come up with that example. So I would have reframed my first question to be something along the lines of, think about the last time that your school or your district organized a professional development session for your staff. Um, you know, so that's a good example of why you would want to pilot test your instrument. Now, having said that, because John took it in a different direction, doesn't mean I can't answer my questions. And if I didn't pilot test this, what I might look to do after having someone like John that I've interviewed, I might look to then start purposefully sampling the people that I interview to find some that do are doing the sort of in-school version of it and some that are doing the version like John had where their principal is sending them off somewhere to do it to see if the experience between the two groups is similar or different. You know, that's one of the ways in which the data might take you in a different direction than what you had initially been planning. You know, and that causes you to make some changes in your study design as you're going along to accommodate for those things. Now, in some cases, you might think, well, I'm not really not interested in what those differences or similarities might be. I'm just interested in sort of the broad questions that I've got there. So while I can pull John's data into the larger data set, I know that he's probably going to be in, you know, the comments that he made to me are going to be a bit of an outlier in terms of what we're doing. Right? Now, if you look at the two broad questions that I've got, first of all, the first thing you should notice is that I jumped around a bit. You know, we started off talking about the first one, and John hit on some of those questions, you know, those additional prompts that I've got there. But you'll notice that when the time was right, and it happened actually right at a time when John started talking about, you know, well, we learned all these useful strategies. And as soon as he said that, instead of going back and picking up on all of the things he might have missed from that first question, that was a good way to naturally lead the conversation to that second question. So you'll notice that, as I mentioned, I transitioned to that second question when the time was right as a part of the conversation. But once we had sort of played out at least what I thought was the pertinent information from that second question, you'll note that I transitioned back to the first to get some more information about that. right? Because there were a couple of key things that I thought would be important in terms of teacher perception. You know, I was interested in whether or not this was the, the, the spray and pray model or if they actually got to see like demonstrations or as John indicated in his response you know they actually got the hands-on let's play with this and the presenter actually set it up in much the same way that John said he sets it up with his kids where you know it was very much of an unstructured play at the beginning of it and then he brought them around and sort of told them how he'd use those things kind of thing you know so I was very interested in that kind of format uh, you know that he did you could tell just from his facial expressions that man you know the way in which his intonation the way in which he described things it was clear that he enjoyed it you know the way in which he talked about it particularly when he talked about the way in which he had used it with his students you could clearly tell that he got a lot out of it you know so those were in questions that I didn't necessarily need to ask because a lot of you know his nonverbal cues and a lot of sort of reading between the lines of the conversation presented itself. You know that's one of the reasons why most traditionally most people would just audio record the interview so that they could transcribe it. What you're seeing more and more these days is in addition to an audio recording, a lot of people are doing a video recording as well. Um, you know because it does capture a lot of that data. 
you know, once John got a little bit comfortable, and particularly once he started talking about how he started using the students, you could see he got, he got excited. You know, he got passionate about it. That's not necessarily something that's going to come, well, it's definitely not something that's going to come across in a transcript. Depending upon the nature of the person you're interviewing, you know, while John got somewhat excited, his voice didn't change all that much. And John, in terms of his speaking pattern, is a fairly even-toned kind of guy. You know, so an audio recording might not have picked it up as much. Now, most people, when they're doing an interview, and you'll notice I had my pen out um, there. No, I didn't end up writing anything. Usually I have it so I can jot down a word or two that will remind me to come back and get something. Um, and in a much longer interview, I probably would have done that. Um, most people will also use it to take field notes. right? So they'll essentially note things in sort of an unobtrusive way. I mean, I had my pen out. It was ready to go. You know, I had it in my writing hand. I generally had it over by the paper or, you know, somewhere where it could get there pretty quickly. But I didn't want to be sat there writing the whole time while John was talking. I wanted to actually be engaged in a conversation with him. Right, so you have to kind of get good at, and some people are very good at it, writing while not looking at the paper. Other people aren't. If you're not, what I would tell you to do when you get home tonight, sit down and watch whatever sitcom or drama that you would normally watch on a Friday night, and try to write out notes about what you see on the TV without looking at the page. You know, Do that a few times before you end up doing your first interview. Do that several times before you do your first set of observations because there's nothing worse in an observation than seeing something and having to put your head down to write it. You're missing everything that's going on while you're writing it. Now, having the video recording helps with that because it allows you to pause or allows you to go back and do things, right? But, you know, Taking field notes for specific things beyond just things you want to return to or ask about later. You know, noting when John gets excited. You know, and again, a transcript wouldn't get that unless you had field notes. You'll note when John started, he was sat here with his hands in his pocket of his, his hoodie type thing, his sweater there. You know, as things transitioned, particularly when he started talking about his students, both hands were out. One was swinging around. The other one was banging on, I mean, you know, you know, bouncing off of the table there. Um, you know, those are things that you would note as a part of your field notes. You know, because, and how you note it is entirely up to you. You know, something in square parentheses in your transcription that says, you know, John became more animated. You know, that just is that little cue to tell you. <coughs> one of the things I always recommend to folks um, your recorder may have a timer on it. If not, I always try to put my watch, and it's nice, better if you have a digital watch for this, um, up so that you can actually see the time, because then you can note when things happen. You know, seven minutes in, John became animated. Right, so that way when you're doing your transcription, you know when you get to the seven minute mark of the recording as you're transcribing, that's where that field note belongs. Right, so you have to figure out a way of essentially attaching the audio recording to the list of field notes that you have. You know, and timing is actually one of those. Um, and typically what I would do is I would do the entire transcription first because when I'm transcribing, I'm playing it back at a speed slower than real time. So it makes it easier to transcribe. And once I've got the transcription done, then I'll listen to it in real time because then it's going at the appropriate speed, and that's when I'll add in my field notes, because that's when I can put in the timing sequence correctly. Any other questions in terms of what you guys just saw there and how that jives up with, with what you, that handout that I just gave? All right.